sessions, beverages and food are upstairs in the atrium. That's also where lunch will be. For those of you who registered for dinner today, that will be in the faculty club, and the performance of year one of the Empire is in the Shapiro Center. If you're unfamiliar with the campus, there is a map in your registration packet, or you can just follow the herd. Of course, if you have any problems or questions, you can ask Charity Adams, the American Studies Administrator, whom I think most of you have been in touch with, and who has been doing yeoman service putting this event together. There are also student assistants roaming about. They, they're the younger looking people. Uh, we'll try to keep rigorously to the program, right? And we ask you that, uh, out of courtesy to the presenters, to try to file into the room here punctually at the scheduled time for each session. Also, several of you have asked how you might make a donation to the American Studies program to defray conference expenses in honor of Joyce. There are instructions on our website if you would like to do this, or you can make a check out to the Larry Fuchs Fund and hand it over to the charity. Uh, there will be a cascade of heartfelt praise over the next two days for the top of the bill, and I'd like to start it off. The occasion for this conference is what for us in the American Studies program is a lamentable development, namely the retirement of our beloved colleague, Joyce Sampler. It is by way of small acknowledgement of Joyce's influence in the field, or I guess I should say fields, women's studies, American studies, Judaic studies, education, the performing arts. The sessions, in fact, have been organized around the disciplinary themes that have informed Joyce's work. Of course, the conference is not just scholarly, it's personal a way for us to recognize Joyce's unstinted kindness, her unfailing good humor, her selfless service, and above all, her friendship as a leader and colleague. Joyce has maintained her congeniality, her native smarts, and her rock-solid integrity throughout some difficult passages for the American Studies program at Brandeis. Never forgetting to keep her eye on the main thing, nurturing an environment where her colleagues and her students may thrive. There's no saying that any in any organization, 10% of the people do 90% of the work. And everyone in, at Brandeis knows that Joyce is one of the people who make this place click. I suspect there may be one or two Jewish mother jokes in the next couple of days. <laughs> and speaking of Jewish mothers, no matter what Steve Antler tells you, uh, it was I and not he who first suggested the title of Joyce's book on the subject. <laughs> you never call, you never write, this is beautiful. Mother. But although Jewish matriarchs uh, are one of Joyce's many areas of expertise, I have to say, although her daughters Rachel and Laura might disagree, that I never associated that stereotype with Joyce. She's no Molly Goldberg. She's more akin to another Brandeis professor, Eleanor Roosevelt, a fierce fighter for what she believes in, a dedicated scholar, and an all-around great heart. You're a terrific colleague and a wonderful friend, Joyce. Thank you so much for being who you are. Try not to be embarrassed over the next two days as your friends and colleagues pay tribute to your influence with work inspired by and akin to your own, and who I dare say will be offering their own heartfelt words of praise. I am very sorry that you're stepping down, but really you're not the kind of person who ever really steps down. You're always one of those who steps up. And I know that you will be that will be true as you enter the ranks of narrow tie. Also, you can keep your office. <laughs> Good morning and welcome. I'm Karen Hansen uh, in the Department of Sociology and Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies. Ever since I came to Brandeis, Joyce has been a role model. On campus, she exercised grace and wisdom, as well as advocacy for feminist scholarship and women's studies. <clears throat> okay, I could join the women's studies community and try to write a magnificent biography, but how could I be so tall? <laughs> I settled for teaching a class on gender and biography, uh, wearing distinctive earrings, and team teaching with Joyce three times. It gives me great pleasure to chair this session and share the stage with these scholars who absolutely define the field of women's biography, as does Joyce herself. Candace Flock, who could not be here today, uh, sends a message, a quote in true Candace fashion, from a letter written by Emma Goldman to Helen Keller, the 8th of February, 1916. <clears throat> 
I have heard you speak, and I want you to know it was one of the most stirring events in my life. You are a remarkable woman. I appreciate more than I can tell your wonderful spirit, which has enabled you to keep in touch with the great pulse of life. I want you to know that I am very proud of you, one truly big, brave American woman. <laughs> Joyce, dear, she says, we adore you, Lachlan and Mazel tov. Each presenter on the panel um, has 20 minutes, and afterward, they, after they have all presented, we'll open the floor for discussion, a rousing discussion, I anticipate. So I will introduce each in turn. Susan Ware specializes in 20th century U.S. history, women's history, and biography. Since 2012, she has served as the general editor of American National Biography, and in 2014-15, she served as senior advisor to the Schlesinger Library, Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study, Harvard University. Susan Ware, The Challenge of Feminist Biography Revisited. survey of the field of biography, Hermione Lee declared that the recovery phase of women's biography was over. This is a quote. The phase of disinterring obscure life and of claiming new status and significance for women's stories, a process of consciousness raising that has been described as critical to the feminist project of transforming the public sphere, can now be spoken of in the past tense. End of the quote. Lee's observation rings true but I would argue that the need for feminist biography is just as strong today as it was in the 1960s and 70s. It will just be a different kind of feminist biography, and it will fill a different kind of need. Uh, biography is not static. The genre is constantly changing and evolving. And not surprisingly, feminist biography has its own history, one which is linked both to larger shifts in the field of biography but even more so to the changing fortunes and priorities of modern feminism. The concerns of issues uh, that animated feminism and feminist <coughs> biography in the 1970s and 80s are quite different from the concerns and issues of today. And luckily so. It is this ability to evolve and adapt while never losing sight of the central insights of feminist biography that women's lives matter and that gender is a key category of analysis that bodes well for its continued relevance. But like the complex, multiple forms that feminism takes in 21st century America, the case for feminist biography is, many, is in many ways harder or more subtle to make than when feminist biography first burst on the scene. Now, feminist scholar Carolyn Heilbrunn dates the emergence of feminist biography to the publication of Nancy Milford's Zelda in 1970. And I think it's worth pausing to remember those heady days. Uh, for those of us who uh, had imbibed the powerful ideas of modern feminism, there was this incredible sense of being part of a very special community, almost a secret society where everything suddenly looked different when viewed from a feminist perspective. It was almost like walking around in a state of continual arousal. And books, especially biographies, were very much part of this consciousness-raising project. And many biographies from that initial recovery phase were not necessarily written from a feminist perspective. If you think of the difference between Joe Lash's Eleanor, book about Eleanor Roosevelt in 1971 and Blanche Cook's uh, from the 90s, but they were folded into the feminist project precisely because they were contributing to the reclaiming of women's past. And that so many women were waiting to be rediscovered and introduced to modern audiences gave this phase of feminist biography a sense of incredible <coughs> urgency and energy, which I doubt we will see again in our lifetime. Um, much of the impetus behind this initial recovery was based on an acceptance of difference. Women's lives were different from men's, and therefore they needed a different kind of biography. And the best way to do that was by foregrounding gender as the central analytical category. And that is still true, but our understanding of gender over the past four decades has changed. The 
ongoing relevance of gender for men as well as for women, I would add, is one of the key reasons why feminist biography is still necessary, but it must be deployed intersectionally in ways that embrace other factors besides just gender. And it must explain a world in which men's and women's lives are increasingly similar, yet still shaped by subtle and resilient forms of discrimination and subordination. Now, one of the most important theoretical interventions of the early days of feminist biography was the recognition that the private and the public spheres were very closely intertwined. And as I often put it when describing this approach, who you sleep with and who pays the bills have implications beyond the bedroom. In other words, in order to tell women's lives, it was impossible to concentrate solely on public accomplishments and public events, with matters of personal life relegated to a stray sentence or two along the way. Such an approach would miss the texture and contours, as well as the trade-offs and challenges of most women's lives. Now, early feminist biographers didn't just make up this concept. The personal and political was obviously a central tenet of second wave feminism. But the concept had a utility far beyond just consciousness raising. It also had the potential to suggest a new approach to biography that melded the personal and the political into a seamless whole. So historicizing feminist biography, I would say that the heyday of that approach was the 1980s and 90s. Uh, feminist biographers posited that the traditional narrative arcs that trace a male model of success or achievement did not necessarily apply to women <coughs> subjects. Women's public lives rarely unfolded in straightforward ways. They were often complicated by struggles to obtain education, find productive work, escape the distractions of traditional female roles, uh, to say nothing of dealing with marriage and motherhood. More than anything else, the hallmark of feminist biography was close attention to the connections between subjects' personal and professional lives. And nowhere is this more clear than in a volume of edited essays published in 1992 entitled The Challenge of Feminist Biography. All pieces of historical scholarship are affected by when they are written, but this volume has 1980s stamped all over it, making it an especially clear marker of where the field was at that point. Uh, comprised of a general introduction, which Joyce is one of the co-authors, followed by essays of nine historians, including Joyce and myself, um, about our biographical journeys, the volume presented itself as a, as a uh, primer, primer or workshop on this new thing called feminist biography. Uh, authors were urged to be, uh, this is a quote from the introduction, personal, open, and honest uh, in our essays. So we included quite a lot about the process of doing biography, which was quite unusual at the time. And as biographers and as feminists, we all felt like trailblazers and pioneers, but also a bit defensive about our decision to pursue biography and of elite white middle-class women to boot at a time when women's history was focusing on reclaiming the lives of ordinary women. Uh, and it is quite striking that the volume is composed only of white women writing about white subjects. I don't, I don't think that would happen now. Um, we also realized, as had legions of biographers in the past, that biographers invariably enter into complicated relationships with their subjects, who basically become part of your life and practically <coughs> move into your house. And the volume contains several hilarious examples of children referring to their mother's subjects as siblings. This is all <laughs> Accepting as a given that there was no such thing as a totally objective biography, we embraced our subjectivity. And because these biographies were being written while we, the authors, were trying to establish professional careers in the new field of women's history, at the same time we were also juggling our full personal lives, the essays are quite uh, self-revelatory. But it, it is this combination of subjectivity and charting new ground that makes the book feel dated. A view confirmed when I team taught it in a graduate class for the, um, for the consortium on feminist biography several years ago. Students were especially <coughs> perplexed at why questions of having it all 
that is combining marriage, children, and satisfying professional work dominated so many of the narratives. Uh, and there was a reason for that, of course. In the 1980s, when these projects were being researched and written, that question of finding the right balance between work and family was very much on the feminist agenda, especially for elite women. But those concerns just didn't resonate quite so uh, closely with younger readers who, I think, had moved on to newer questions, their own questions, on the feminist agenda. I think the focus on the personal political connection also felt dated, although for different reasons. It is now much more common for biographies of men as well as women to include a hefty dose of personal material. So this approach doesn't seem so new or path-breaking anymore. And while feminist biography, biography will no doubt always pay close attention to this dynamic, it is no longer the dominant or unique characteristic that it once was. And in many ways, uh, this is a measure of success. Um, the girls win. Uh, but it also reflects a widening of the focus of feminist biography to incorporate other priorities, all the while keeping gender at the center. And I think for me, it was Barbara Ransby's masterful biography of Ella Baker, which appeared in 2003. That was the first biography to test my allegiance to the personal political paradigm. And I think it's not a coincidence that this was a biography of an African-American woman. Making it clear that her personal life was her business alone, Baker <coughs> insisted that she be judged on her political actions and influence not on any notions of her role as a daughter, wife, or caretaker of her niece. And this stance fundamentally affected how Ransby framed the book. It wasn't simply a question of absence of sources, it was more where the focus of the narrative was and where, what the interpretation should be. And as Darlene Clark Hine and others have pointed out, African American women have plenty of reasons to keep their feelings and emotions hidden from a prying racist society. If so, the feminist biography model of connecting the personal to the political may not work equally well across all fields of women's history. Turning that question on its head, Ransby's biography suggests that the most radical position a woman could take is to move beyond gender and ask to be judged just simply as a human being. But feminist biographers are not likely uh, to be willing to give up their focus on gender. Indeed, Ransby consistently deploys it, especially when uh, explaining Baker's battles with male ministers who dominated the public leadership of the civil rights movement. But it serves as a caution against putting too much emphasis on the distinctiveness of this feminist insight. I had my own confrontation with the limits of this approach in my aborted attempt to write a biography of suffragist Alice Paul. Uh, on its face, Paul and I were a perfect match of biographer and subject. Um, most of my biographical working writing has centered on the history of feminism in the 20th century. Her activism, which spanned suffrage militancy through the revival of feminism in the 60s and 70s, would give me the opportunity to write a broad history of the movement through her individual life. Her papers were even at the Schlesinger Library, which is right around the corner from where I live. Um, but things didn't quite turn out as I had planned. Um, my first attempt to sort out why I gave up the project was an article published by the journal of Women's History called <coughs> The Book I Couldn't Write, Alice Paul and the Challenge of Feminist Biography. In it, I made much of the fact that Alice Paul was so single-mindedly devoted to her activism that she didn't have a personal <coughs> life to speak of. Uh, in an image of a journal I kept, I drew a large donut, which was the history of feminism, with a small hole in the middle, which was Alice Paul. And by that, I meant the absence of a personal Alice Paul, someone who had friends and family, who took vacations, who read books, who got her period, who did the things that women <laughs> do. And without that personal Alice to play off the political Alice, I felt at a loss as a biographer. Where was my story? <coughs> I 
now suspect that I latched onto that explanation as a stand-in for what was really at the heart of the problem. I had no affinity for Alice Paul as a subject. <laughs> and I could not figure out a way to make her entire life interesting to myself, let alone to the general readers <coughs> I had hoped to reach. And as an aside, I should say that unlike most of the biographers, Alice Paul biographers, who tend to focus on her exciting, very sexy years of suffrage militancy, I'm still old fashioned enough to think that biographies should include the whole life. Um, but I found myself increasingly put off by her narrow vision of feminism, with its focus entirely on legal rights to the exclusion of other factors affecting women's lives. And it was this range of issues and problems, not just that she lacked a personal life, that caused, quote, the book I could not write. Uh, so I think the moral to feminist biographers is as the field continues to change and evolve, so too must our approaches. And I think probably the biggest challenge today for feminist biography is finding the right balance between gender and competing factors in interpreting the lives of women, both in history and in contemporary society. Younger feminists just don't think just in terms of women's issues. They have grown up in a world where feminism has always been in the water, as Jennifer uh, Baumgartner brilliantly put it. They never experienced the blatant discrimination of their mothers and grandmothers' generations, and their much more capacious understanding of sexuality and gender identity, <coughs> sorry, goes far beyond the old male-female binary and beaming things over there. Um, <laughs> Being, being a woman is just one part of their makeup, uh, not necessarily the dominant factor. So to look at women's lives primarily through the lens of gender seems limited and frankly outdated. Of course, it's wrong to imply that earlier generations of feminist biographers ignored such factors as race, class, or, or sexuality. They didn't, even though the concept of intersectionality had not been named yet. But they were so committed to writing women back into history that they tended to focus on the <coughs> structural barriers and cultural norms that had conspired to limit women's options. That priority seems less pressing now that the, now that the recovery project is over and feminism has become an accepted, if still contested, part of American life. So the challenge for feminist biography today is how to tell women's stories when men's and women's lives are increasingly similar but still differ significantly, although less so than before. It is no longer enough that the subject is a woman. There must be other compelling reasons for engaging her life. And gender may or may not be the most salient factor, although it's always there. And this is a very different terrain from when the field first burst on the scene in the 1970s. And while the recovery project may be over, we are still far from anything approaching gender parity when it comes to biography, or life in general, I would add. Um, one only needs to look at Wikipedia, which is notorious for its underrepresentation of women, for confirmation of this point. And I can add my perspective as general editor of American National Biography, which was conceived in the 1980s and 90s, a period when women's history was thriving. And yet, imagine my dismay when I took over and realized that only 18% of the entries were on women. And women were dramatically discriminated against in terms of the length of the essays. Only five women rated longer essays than, get this, the Three Stooges. <laughs> now, examples like this confirm that any notions that women will now be automatically integrated into the larger biographical project are patently false. Alas, if editors and gatekeepers don't vigilantly pay attention, the situation defaults back to privileging dead white males. This sobering realization is yet another reason for the ongoing need and relevance of feminist biography. Just as there will always be a need for feminism, there will always be a need for feminist biography, both of which affirm that women's lives matter. Feminist biography posits gender as an important category of analysis, but not the only one. While it acknowledges that discrimination is less blatant in the past, it does not let men or the system off the hook. What feminist biography does is ask hard, probing questions about the combinations of opportunities and barriers that shaped <coughs> women's lives in the past 
and continue to do so, albeit in different ways, in the contemporary world. As we settle into the 21st century, this feminist biographical perspective, which so many of us work so hard to set in motion, is just as necessary as ever. Thank you. Matthew's Distinguished Professor Emerita from Northeastern University in Boston. She has been recognized for her work in American music and on the history of women in music in particular. Her award-winning books and articles include Women Making Music, The Western Art Tradition uh, 1150 to 1950, co-edited with Jane Bowers, Ruth Crawford Seeger, A Composer's Search for American Music, Erin Copeland's America, A Cultural Perspective, and Music in the USA, A Documentary Comparison. She's been elected to the Academy of Arts and Sciences as a, quote, innovator in the field of music biography, and is an honorary member of the American Musicological Society. She received the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Society for American Music Currently, she's working on a biography of Ella Fitzgerald for W.W. W. Norton. Judith.